Good morning, Merch Church. Gotta jump to your feet. It's good to see you guys. Put your hands together, lift your voices. We're gonna worship Jesus today. Before you sit down, would you turn to three people and say hi, Connie? Say hi. It's good to see you. Glad you're here. Share some love. Awesome. Now 
Uh, you can have a seat. I'm Johnny. I'm one of the pastors here. It feels good to say that. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm new if you didn't know that, but hey, if you're new here today, thank you. If you're new here today, we'll be new together, and I would love to meet you. I'd love to have a chance to meet you out in the lobby after the service. If you are new, we'd also love to get to know you better in this way. If you will text to this 479-348-4555, if you'll text CONNECT to that number, it'll take you straight to our digital connection card, and you can fill that out online. It would be fantastic. Of course, there's a connection card in the back of the seat, and if you're out there online, welcome. We're so glad that you've joined us today. If you're remotely close enough to drive and come be here in person, I'd love to meet you. We'd love to give you a hug and welcome you into our family, so be sure and make that happen. Put something in the chat. Let us know that you were here today. If you have prayer requests, anybody, if you want have questions, we would love to be able to answer those questions just to get to know you a little bit better. Now, I have a story for you guys, and it just, it's just the wildest, craziest story that uh, this week, and I, I must confess, Jacob's a crier, I'm a crier, and so I called and uh, talked to Carissa, and I want you to meet the Santa Sarah family, and I talked to Carissa this week, Bill, uh, Brody, and Liam, and uh, I got their story about where they've been. A few years ago, they find themselves in Florida, and a hurricane comes through, kind of like what we just had, but not as bad as this one was, right? Uh, but they're, in a, and everything gets wiped out, they lose everything. They end up moving to Atlanta in the spring of 2020. What happened in the spring of 2020? I can't remember exactly. Oh, yeah. No, they're locked down in Atlanta together as a family. And what you need to know about their family is that Bill was an atheist. And not just a, uh, we don't know, but, but a smart, intelligent, thinking atheist that said, these are the reasons that I'm an atheist. And Carissa grew up in the Catholic Church. And she had long since left the church. And so they're raising their two boys. They're locked down. And they begin to ask the questions like many did in 2020. What is going on? Rich, deep conversations. Deep, rich questions. And they go to the scripture. They go to the word. And they find life in scripture. Surrender their lives to Jesus. And their lives are transformed completely during that window of time. Fast forward to summer of 21, they move here. And just some coincidence, a contractor from Merge Church. You guys believe in coincidence? No, I don't believe in coincidence. Yeah. Rusty is working at their house, and they're telling him we've never found a church home. They gave him some of their story, and he says, I love my church. You need to come to my church. So they jump in the car, and they drive down here. No, nope, that's, that's not how people do it anymore, is it? They got online. They watched some messages. They get connected. They say, this could be a place that we could belong. They come and visit, and they found what all of you have found. Friendly smiles, hugs, a warm welcome, some great coffee from the host team, right? Their boys go into kids. They love Merge Kids, and they're getting connected there. They come in here, and the worship is rocking. How about some love for this worship team, right? <laughs> Pastor Jacob bringing the word and their life. She, she said, we've never been happier. And we're so grateful that God has done so much. All glory to him. But we want you to know how much we love the Merge family. So last weekend, you can kind of tell by the picture, all four of them were baptized right here at Merge Church. I'm, I'm listening to that story, and I'm just, I'm on the phone, and I'm just crying. I'm like, this is how it works. The entire body coming together. Loving on people, welcoming them in. So listen, if you're new here, or maybe you've been here a while and you're not fully engaged like you know you could be, step in. Fill out the connect cards, go through growth track, get on a team, get in a circle, figure out what it means to be all in as you live out your faith before others. And before long, I'll tell you what's going to happen. You'll be baptizing someone right down here in the tank. Because God will use that faithfulness. We're going to continue to worship. If you guys could get on your feet with me. Uh, we worship by giving. And one of the best and easiest ways to give is online. Uh, all the links are up here. You can figure that out. You can drop your giving out in the uh, generosity box as well. And I just have to say thank you to those who I didn't mention that part in the story. 
but so many have been so faithful to give over time, investing in the kingdom, and lives are being transformed through your faithfulness in that. Let's pray. Father, you're so good to us. You continue to impact so many lives in the River Valley, and we know that the best is still yet to come. So right now, we lift you up. We give you all the glory for everything that's going on. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and God's people said, amen. Let's go. Tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me.
service that while getting ready for this song, I was reminded, thinking back about when it came out a few years ago, about the word reckless was so controversial for some people. Like they just couldn't think of the word reckless love in association with God. And, you know, I teach school and I teach literacy and words have weight and meaning to me. They are really important to me. And the more I thought about that word reckless, the more it's like there is no better word. There is no better word than reckless when we're talking about the love of God. And I think about, I'm a mom of three boys who have seen great days and have seen dark days. And I'm going to tell you right now, there is nowhere that those boys couldn't go, that I wouldn't recklessly go after them, that I wouldn't let go of all of everything that meant anything to me to get those boys from what they needed saving from. I would do that for them in a second. And if we as earthly beings will do that for our children and for our family and people that are important to us, what more will our heavenly father do for us? He will be reckless for us. Reckless. He will come after us in the darkest pit. I've been in that pit, and he is right there, recklessly loving me through it. And I think about the cross, and there is nothing more reckless than the gritty, grimy, dirty cross, right? Like that you would put your only son on a cross to die for the sins of the world, for people who... You can't guarantee they're coming to you. That's reckless. It's reckless to do that. It's reckless of a shepherd to leave 99 to go for one. And yet he'll do it every single time. Every time. So as we sing this, if reckless was something that like, you're like, oh, God is kind of hard to say about God being reckless but if you think about it in that way it's reckless for me and I'm so grateful for the times that he has recklessly pursued me and drawn me closer to him so we're going to sing this chorus again and just sing about that reckless love that he has for us and know that there is no place that he won't come after you No place is too dark and too dirty and too grimy for him. No place. today you are recklessly pursuing each and every one of us. We thank you, Father God, that you don't let us go, that you don't turn and give up on us, but that you continue to pursue, that you continue to pursue. We love you. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name.
of heaven pour your spirit out pour your spirit out yeah. oh won't you pour your spirit out oh, from past
got the power of your presence for your spirit out for your spirit out oh it's all we need Jesus strength to show up in our weakness, Lord. We need your peace in our chaos. We need your joy in our sadness. Reassure us, God. Remind our hearts that you see us now. Remind our hearts that you see us. Remind our souls that you see us, God. That you see us, Father. Remind us that we belong to you. We've been adopted into your family, God. Remind us to be that family, God. To our brothers and sisters. Help us to stand in the gap for those around us, God. Help us to be your eyes. Help us to be your ears. Help us to be your mouth, God. Help us to be your feet. To see your people. To know your people. To love your people, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. We want to see your people like you do, God. There's so many hurting brothers and sisters around you. Help us to see them, God us to be that move of your spirit. So many times we forget that you move through us and we're sitting here and we're waiting and we're waiting for him to move and he's waiting for us to move because he's already enabled you and he's already equipped you to be the move of his spirit. And I'm so guilty of that. We all are. And I just pray that God enables you and he emboldens you to walk with a boldness like never before, that he'll quicken it in your spirit through your day-to-day to be the move of his spirit, to be the move of God, to be that revival that we sing about. It starts right here. He lives right here. This is his dwelling place now, right here. This is his temple. Don't desecrate it. I know we will, but... You're a walking, breathing temple of his goodness, of his spirit, of his joy. It should flow from you. Joy is sustaining. Happiness comes and goes, but joy is sustaining, and it comes from the Father. And I just, man, I speak that over every single person watching online and everybody in this room right now. I speak it over myself, my family, that we'll be walking, breathing, spirit moves of God. In Jesus' name, let us be a move of God. In Jesus' name, let us be a move of God. In Jesus' name, let us be a move of God. Like never before, like we've never seen before, let us be the move of the Holy Spirit in every facet of our lives. Well, we just honor you. Move upon our praise, God. Let your spirit dwell inside of us, God. Well, we love you. We honor you today. We just sing your praise, God. You are why we are here. It wasn't for us. It's it's all for you. 
you are why we gather. You are why we gather, God, to bless your name, to hold your name into the highest. Thank you, Father. Oh, your spirit, God. Oh, your spirit, God. God, that's our prayer this morning. That is our prayer this morning, Father. We honor you. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Come on, can we give him praise in this house? Doesn't he deserve high praise? Amen. 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 You may grab a seat right where you are. My name is Jacob. So good to have you in the house with us. If you're joining us online, we say welcome. If you leave here empty, it is of your own doing because he came to give a fresh wind and a fresh perspective and a fresh anointing to each and every one of us. It's not reserved for somebody on the platform. It's a mistake that we make when we come into the gathering. There is nothing special or unique about me. I am just one of you. We all surrender what we have to God and we see him pour it out. I'm going to dive straight into scripture this morning. It's a passage that may be familiar to you if you have grown up around church. I pray that for many of you, this is the first time that you hear it, and I believe that we're going to pull some things from it that are going to make us better. Mark 6, picking up in verse 30, it says, The apostles gathered around Jesus. You can just stop there. Because what we're going to see is miraculous things come, and can I tell you that miracles come when you gather around Jesus. Jesus, the miracle maker. The apostles gathered around Jesus and they reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to the disciples, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place but many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of the disciples. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so Jesus' disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered, you give them something to eat. Then they said to Jesus, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Go and see. When they find out, they came back and said, five loaves and two fish. And then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, Jesus gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then Jesus gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. The number of men who had eaten from what started with five loaves and two fish was 5,000, meaning the number of people that actually ate 
would be somewhere around 10, 15, maybe even 20,000 people. In this passage, Jesus was speaking to a large crowd out in a remote place, and the disciples said, hey, man, can you send them away so they can go and eat? And instead, Jesus looks at the disciples, and he tells the disciples to give something to the crowd. So here's the question for today. What do you do when you have a need, but God calls you to someone else's? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and your truth and the opportunity to receive it. And God, I pray that each and every one of us would do just that. We would receive the life-giving, life-transforming power of the word of God in our lives here and now in this moment. And God, when we receive it, I know that we will walk out of this place better than when we came in. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, what do you do when you have a need in your life and you're believing that God's going to feel it, you're believing that God's going to show up, you're believing he's going to answer it, but in the midst of all of that, he calls you to meet someone else's need. This is a challenge for each and every one of us, myself included. There, There are times in my life when I'm believing and I'm praying and I'm seeking God with everything that I have, and I've got some needs that I need him to show up and meet. And in the midst of my seeking, him for my need he calls me to somebody else's and I think are you serious I'm putting in the work here I'm giving you everything that I have I need you to show up and meet my need in this moment when we're seeking God for our needs many of us get stuck in the waiting. Do any of you have the friends that when you send them the text message, it tells you if they have read it or not? You know, like God will send us a message and it's like we text them back and he'll be like, hey, I need you to go over here and meet this person's need. And if you're like me, I text them back and I'm like, well, when, where, how, what's the resource? What am I going to get out of it? Are you sure you don't want to answer my request first? Because if I had a great testimony, I sure could change their life. I send that and it shows red. But he doesn't say anything else. He doesn't respond. So I'm left in the waiting. And for far too many of us as believers, we get stuck in the waiting. We get stuck in the time between when the message is read by God and when the response is received by us. It's in this time that we have a tendency to insert our insinuations and our thoughts our feelings, our desires, our preferences, and our limitations. You know when you text your friends something that's really important and it shows that they've read it, but they don't immediately respond? You don't see the bubbles? What do you begin to do? Insert your thoughts and your feelings and your insinuations and your preferences and your limitations. We don't just do that with one another. We have a tendency to do the exact same thing with God in the middle of the waiting. And I've learned that in my waiting, he almost always calls me to someone else's need. We wait for God to, we wait to give We wait for God to give more details, but God waits for us to respond in obedience. Obedience, a really unpopular word in today's culture. We are waiting for God to give more details, but God is waiting for us to respond in obedience. And like the disciples who received the direction to feed the crowd but did not know how, we need to decide whether to stay or to move through obedience. There are three things I believe we can pull from this passage that cause us to get stuck in the waiting that I believe we're all going to overcome today. The first thing is this. It's the conversation of comfort. In verse 31, it tells us that the disciples didn't get a chance to eat. They were not just hungry, they became hangry. 
About 11 o'clock in my day, if somebody's asking for something for me, they got a problem because I got some lunch plans that I got to get to, right? I mean, it's time to eat. I don't like to be hungry because being hungry is uncomfortable. It's a place that none of us like to be. And so they're having to have this conversation of comfort. The real reasons the disciples wanted Jesus to send the crowds away was because they themselves were hungry. It sounds good. Jesus, send them away. It's late. They need to get to the villages and get something to eat. What they're really saying to one another is who can convince Jesus to send all these people away so we can eat? You know what I'm saying? They have a need in their life. They're hungry. They're uncomfortable in this moment. But they were at risk of missing out on something God wanted to do because they were quickly becoming more concerned with their comfort than their calling. See, it's in the disciples' hunger that they experienced the miraculous. Wouldn't you be willing to be hungry for a few hours longer if you could see Jesus take five loaves and two fish and feed 20,000 people? In their hunger, they almost missed out on the miraculous. But here's what I want us to do as a body of believers, as a church community. I want us to become hungry for the things of God. I want us to be hungry for the things of God. I want us to get to the end of ourself and say, God, it's now time for you to do what only you can do. And we practice the discipline of being hungry for God in what is called fasting. You may be brand new to church, and that is so cool if you are. So fasting is when we give up something, typically, historically and scripturally, it would be food. We would give up food, and then there's a second part. In the time we would spend eating that food, we replace it with the greater things of God. Being still in his presence, worshiping him, reading his word, communicating with him. We, we replace that time with things of God. We are saying, God, I am spiritually hungry for more of you, so I'm going to take the time that I use to fill my physical comfort with a greater desire for you. Why? Because when we are hungry for the things of God, we have an opportunity to see the miraculous in our lives. So we as a church body, are going to begin a seven-day fast tomorrow. Everybody's waiting for like the four weeks of announcements, right? Because that's how we do it in the church world today. It's like four weeks of get ready and don't forget. It's 87 social. No, no, no. Tomorrow, we're going to begin a seven-day fast. At the very end of today, Pastor Johnny's going to come up, and he's going to give you the resources for how you can sign up because we as a team have developed a seven-day scripture and prayer guide. It's going to ask you some questions. It's going to give you some scriptures to read, and we're all going to pray and believe and experience the exact same things. Why? Because when 12 of them were hungry, 20,000 were fed. What would happen if all of us got spiritually hungry for the things of God? What would he come and do in this place? But are we more concerned with our comfort than our calling? Are we more concerned with what feels good than what is good? Many of us get stuck in the conversation of comfort, meaning this. We choose comfort over conviction. Obedience and conviction in one message. I'm on fire today. Now, conviction is a word that gets really misrepresented in the church. See, there's condemnation, which we are free from through the bloodshed of Jesus Christ. And condemnation is the world and the enemy and Satan himself telling you that you are not good enough, that you will never measure up, that you can never do enough good to receive the grace of Jesus, and it is all a lie. He came, he lived, he died for you, for me, for every sin we will ever commit. He rose again, defeating death, hell, and the grave all at once so we could be set free. There is no condemnation under the bloodshed of Jesus Christ. But there is conviction. In fact, John 16 and 8 puts it like this. And when he, he being the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit will convict 
the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. What is conviction from the Holy Spirit? It's God himself through the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, reaching down from heaven and saying, you're better, you can do more, you can accomplish greater things, rid yourself of the nonsense because there's a calling and an anointing and a God-given purpose over your life and I want you to go out and get it. But we choose comfort over conviction. And here's the great mistake. If the Holy Spirit is to bring conviction, when we choose comfort over conviction, we're actually rejecting the very person and power of God that dwells within us because we are rejecting his purpose, the Holy Spirit's purpose in our life. When we run from conviction, we're running from God. I remember Kristen and I, we, we had been married not for very long, and she got sick. Now, we grew up in very different sick households. So she grew up in the sick household where it's like they cooked for you, and they like brought you extra blankets, and they checked your temperature every 30 minutes, and they brought you the cold washcloths, and they like went and got your favorite stuff. Like that was the environment she was used to when I was sick. I grew up in the household environment that was like lock yourself up for three days. Don't get everybody else sick. We got to go to work, and when you decide you're man enough to get over it, come on out. That's the truth. So she's sick, and so I'm trying to navigate this, right? Like, this is the collision of two lives into one that nobody talks about. I mean, this is the complication of marriage. And so I'm, I'm trying to be nice and as gracious as I can be. And so, you know, I decide that I'll sacrifice and I'll sleep in the guest bedroom so I don't get sick too. You know what I mean? No sense in both of us being sick, one of those deals. And so I'm in there, but then I get in the bed that night, and we're just, man, I realize, like, she got my blanket. Yeah, I know. I mean, but look, this blanket got me through law school, right? Like it had some good Holy Spirit on it. I mean, like there was, like there was something to this thing, right? And so I'm laying in that bed, and I'm uncomfortable. And I'm trying to discern, like, could I sneak in and, like, swap blankets? Are there too many germs on the blanket? Could I put it on speed wash real quick and still be good? Like, could I just express to her my desire for the blanket and maybe she would be understanding in her moment of sickness? Like, how do I get what will make me comfortable in this moment? And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit convicted me as much in this moment as the Holy Spirit has ever convicted me me. I mean, it's like God himself reached down and smacked me upside the back of the head and said, I called you to be a man and I called you to be a husband. And that means that you serve your wife and you love her and you care for her. And you took a covenant oath that in sickness and in health, you would be there. Now imagine if I reject the conviction of the Holy Spirit in that moment. You're like, how is that conviction from the Holy Spirit? If you ever get prompted to do something good for someone else, it is the Holy Spirit convicting you. And I know this because you and I are rank, nasty, selfish sinners outside the bloodshed of Jesus Christ. And he covers us with his blood and he sends the person of the Holy Spirit to dwell within us, to prompt us so everything good that flows from your life flows through conviction of the Holy Spirit. So when you run from conviction, you're running from the goodness of God that wants to flow in and through your life. You're not just rejecting conviction, you're rejecting God himself. The conversation of comfort is so important that we get past it because when we're more concerned with comfort than calling, we will always live lives of disappointment because you and I were made to serve something greater than ourselves. And we can only grow in faith if we stretch, if we strengthen and if we expand, there's the conversation of comfort that causes us to get sick. Then there's the challenge of certainty that causes us to get stuck. In verse 37, the disciples remarked that it would take half a year's wages to feed all the people in the crowd. They had heard Jesus tell them to feed the crowd, but they were uncertain how it could happen. 
God loves to burst our bubbles of certainty by operating in uncertainty. And for many of us, we think that the opposite of faith is doubt, but the opposite of faith is certainty. And Lamont put it like this. The opposite of faith is not doubt, but certainty. Certainty is missing the point entirely. Faith includes noticing the mess, the emptiness and discomfort, and letting it be there until some light returns. Faith also means reaching deeply within for the sense one was born with, the sense, for example, to go for a walk. See, God doesn't want us to be certain of our own understanding. God wants us to be certain of who he is. So when he calls us to something and we respond asking for all of the details, we'll find ourselves waiting on red because he's asking us not to be certain of the task, but to be certain of who he is. If you have multiple kids, you'll quickly learn that school is very expensive. You assume that all of school is covered in your taxes, but then you learn that there's snack shops, and there's t-shirt days, and there's paw print days, and, and, and there's Santa workshops, and, and there's all these things. And so you, 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 you feel like you're packing quarters all day, every day, and just shoving them in a backpack and praying the kids don't lose them. Collier's going into kindergarten, and it's the first year of his Christmas shopping experience at the school. And so Kristen and I send him with enough money to buy everyone in the family. He has a list of people to buy for so that he'll have Christmas presents to give everyone. And he comes home from school that day, and he has gifts for almost everyone but not everyone. Now, if you know Collier, you know he is a man of details, he makes me so proud. Like He gets the job done. So I'm a little bit surprised that he didn't get for everyone. So I'm asking him about it, and he tells me that there was a kid that didn't quite have enough to get what he needed. So he shared some of his money with this kid. I'm thinking, man, that's like a dad win of the year, right? I got one. Like, chalk it up. If I don't get any more, I'll be all right. That's a good one, Papa. you know? And I'm bragging on him, and I'm loving him up, and I'm so proud of him. And he says, yeah, he says, I I knew that when I told you what happened, that you would give me money because the shop will still be open tomorrow. (laughs) Collier didn't have all the details for how it was going to work out when he got called to meet someone else's need above his own. But he was certain that his father would look at him with love and compassion and affection and that his father would replace that which he had given up. And you better believe I replaced it. I didn't replace it with just the same amount that he gave up. I replaced it with more because I wanted my son to recognize that he's when he's walking in compassion over complacency, when he's walking in the conviction of the Holy Spirit in his life, it will come back to him pressed down and shaken together and running over. How much more does God the Father want you and me to stop being so obsessed with the certainty of how we're going to meet someone else's need and he wants us to step out in obedience and conviction and meet it. Why? Not because I'm certain of how it will all work out. Because I'm certain that my God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, knows what I am doing and knows that I'm walking in his will and believes in me and will come back and restore everything Everything that I have given up. The opposite of faith is certainty. We often receive the message from God, but we're not getting the response to the details that we want. So we get stuck. And when we get stuck, we miss out on the opportunity to see the miraculous in our life. We trade our certainty for faith. Nothing miraculous happens in the moments of certainty. Over the last five years, it has become abundantly clear to me that if it is certain, it is me. 
if there's certainty to where I'm going and what I'm doing and the direction that I'm taking, it is in my strength and my wisdom and my will. When I step out into God's strength and God's wisdom and God's will, I'm always met with a little bit of uncertainty of the details, but I'm certain of who he is. The conversation of comfort causes us to get stuck. The challenge of certainty causes us to get stuck. And then the confusion of calculation causes us to get stuck. How many of you like math? You liked math in school? Man, several hands at the 11 o'clock. Look at that. There was only one at the 9, right? I mean, I thought it was a dead giveaway that nobody liked math, okay? It's supposed to just be one of you so we can all like, <laughs> at that guy, you know? The truth is, though most of us dislike the subject of mathematics, we all become mathematicians when God calls us to step out in faith. The moment God calls us to step out in faith, we quickly begin to calculate all of the reasons that it won't work. We see the disciples doing just that in this moment. They begin to calculate, uh, sir, five loaves and two fish isn't enough to feed 20,000 people. If you'll send them away, five and two will feed 12. We don't like math until it's time to calculate all of the reasons that the very thing God's calling us to do, to meet someone else's needs, will not work out. But the disciples, just like you and I, are missing one key part of the formula. If I asked you as believers, those of you that are believers in the room, if I asked you, is God greater than? I don't have to tell you what the other side of the greater than symbol is. You're going to tell me yes. God is greater than. But God calls us to meet the needs of someone else, and we quickly go, five and two doesn't add up. What the disciples are missing is that they may only have five loaves and two fish, but they also have the incarnate God, Jesus Christ himself, in their midst. And they are forgetting to include him in the calculation. They've become so logical, they forgot to be theological. They forgot to insert the God that is greater than into the calculation of their life. When God calls you to go, you stop asking, how am I going to get there? You say, I heard his voice. I'm stepping out in faith. The math doesn't have to add up because my God is infinite. My God is greater than, and I may only have five and two and 20,000 to feed, but God is with me. He said, yeah, with me. And I often struggle when God calls me to step out in great faith Because I begin to calculate all of the reasons that I'm unqualified. God, I don't have that kind of vision. I don't have that kind of resource. I don't have that kind of faith. I don't have that kind of ability to connect with you. I don't have that kind of leadership. I don't have that kind of sermon structure. I don't have that kind of experience. God, let me tell you, listen, I'm insecure and I'm weak and I'm out of shit. God, are you sure there isn't someone else that could go and do all of these things? And as we begin to allow the calculation of our insecurities to have amount and to add up, we make the greatest false assumption ever, which is that our negatives can somehow subtract from God's greatness. We don't add to God. God says, I am the I am. Because he is uncontainable and unimaginable and everlasting and all-knowing. And you and I cannot take away from the power of God. We can reject him from being in the equation. But as long as we allow him in the equation, your, your weakness and insecurities and doubts and fears will never subtract from the God that is greater than. 
the calculation becomes so confusing because we're like, oh, five and two, it's just not enough. But God is greater than. And notice what Jesus did. They said, man, we got five and two. Yeah, it's not enough, send them away. It says, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke it. And then he gave it back to the disciples to distribute. Jesus took what little the disciples had and he multiplied it to be more than enough. James 1 and 22, the brother of Jesus reminds us of this simple truth. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. God wants you to be a part. He wants your five and two, no matter how insignificant it may seem. He wants your doubts and your fears. He wants your talents. He wants your abilities. But most importantly, God wants all of you. And I have a tendency to say, God, if you'll take the good parts of my life, can't we just display those and use those? He said, no, no, no. I want all of you. I want the negative, and I want the the, the rotten and the nasty and the muck. I want all of you because I want you to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer of it. I want you to participate in the miraculous. So he took the five and two, and he gives thanks for it, and he breaks it, and he multiplies it, then he gives it back to the disciples so that they can feed the masses. And Romans tells us this, that God is working all things together for the good of those who love him. And you may have come in this room and you're like, no, 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 God's not working, not working together the things of my life. I've been stuck in the waiting for far too long. My needs are far too great. God isn't working all of my things together. And I just want to ask you this, with all of the love in my heart, have you given those things to God? Because it wasn't until they gave God that which was insufficient, the five and two, that he had the ability to give thanks, to break it, to multiply it, and to send them out to go and to do the work that they were called to do. And if you're withholding those things from God, no matter how ugly or messy they may be, he cannot come in and take them and give thanks for them and break them and multiply them and restore them to you with something that is so much greater. Gave him the five and the two as insufficient as it may be. And he fed the multitude with it because he wanted them to be a part. Can I tell you that you never lose what you give to God? You never lose what you give to God. Because scripture tells us that not only did they feed the multitudes, They took the baskets and they picked up all of the leftovers and they had 12 basketfuls left. Now I'm no mathematician, but if there's 12 disciples and there's five loaves and two fish, they barely had enough to feed themselves when they showed up. But what they had left after they had given it to God was a basket for each person. More than enough to feed themselves, not just for a moment, for days why because what you give to God what is in your hands he will take he will give thanks for he will break it he will multiply it he will return it to you so that you can distribute to meet someone else's need and you'll have more left over than what you began with when you include the God of greater than in the equation heavenly father Man, we love you and we praise you and we thank you. God, I pray that we as a church over the next seven days that we would be committed to being hungry for more of you. 
that we would get past the conversation of comfort. We would get past the challenge of certainty. We would get past the confusion of calculation and that we would submit ourselves and bring you everything that we have over these next seven days, believing that you'll take what little bit we can offer and that you'll break it, you'll multiply it, you'll give thanks for it, and that you'll restore us not just to where we were, but you'll make us even greater than when we came in to the situation. God, we love you and we praise you. And heads bowed, eyes closed all across this place. Maybe you came in this room today and you don't yet know Jesus. So this whole conversation may seem kind of confusing and kind of weird and kind of different and kind of strange and kind of all of these different things. Actually, y'all look up at me real quick. I read this to the lead team this week, but it's just going to speak life to somebody. I don't know who you are, but I want you to hear about this Jesus that we serve. Because I don't want you to walk out of this room not knowing him. And I don't want you to have a false image of who he is and what he's done for you and me. In Isaiah 53, we see a prophetic word that Jesus Christ will fulfill as the Messiah. It says this. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, he being Jesus. And like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Meaning Jesus came like you and I. He didn't have like a majestic castle and all of this crazy stuff. Like he was a dude. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. He sees you and he knows you. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God. Stricken by him and afflicted. But... Christ was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. So if you came in this room and you feel despised and rejected, if you feel like the world doesn't see you or know you or understand you, if you feel like there is pain all around you, can I tell you, you're in really, really good company because the exact same things were said about and felt by the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. So we're all going to pray this prayer out loud and proud. And if you don't yet know Jesus, will you say this prayer with us today? Dear Jesus, I thank you for dying for my sins. Today, I acknowledge that you are my Savior. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and everybody said a great big Amen. Hey, listen, if you said that prayer for the very first time, would you do us a huge favor? Would you take one of the green connect cards from the seat back in front of you? Or would you jump online at merge.church and fill out a connect card there? And let us know that you have made that decision so we can reach out to you. Over the next few weeks, you're going to have some needs. And we want to meet them with you and for you so that you can begin your spiritual journey in a really fantastically healthy way as part of this community. I love you guys with all of my heart. Fantastic. Yeah, let's give some love to Jake. Wow, 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 wow. Has it been a good day? Good day to be with the church family, right? Let's get on our feet. 30 more seconds, okay? Go ahead and take out your phone. Take out your phone. Here's the phone number. If you'll text the word FAST to that phone number, 
We'll come knock on your door and make sure that you're not eating. No, no, listen. As a church, we're better together. We are better together. And so if you'll text, you'll get a reminder every day of the week uh, of the focus for the day, the scripture, some questions. And we are going to be praying together. Many will be fast. If you have questions about fasting, ask somebody out here. I'll, I'd be glad to walk through what it looks like, how to get started. Never done it. Lots of resources. But listen, it's going to be a fantastic week. Listen, I don't know if it's been as special for you this second, 11 o'clock. You guys are awesome. It's been a special day. Bring somebody back next week with you, and we're going to see God do some incredible things. We love you guys. We'll see you next week.